good morning, good morning. I'm Michael Lee Gerber. You know me as the Wandering Jew. And we're speaking with Rabbi Levi Kunin, and you know him as the Practicing Jew. If you haven't been here before, of course, you're meeting us for the very first time. Today, we're going to be talking about Torah. That's T-O-R-A-H, Torah. It's the five books of Moses. It comes from, well, it comes to the Jewish people um, a long, long, long time ago. And as uh, Rabbi Kunin would say, it was written by God. And here I am speaking to Rabbi Kunin, and I want him to share with us how something presumably written 4,000 years ago, or 3,338 years ago, or 3,497 years ago, or whatever the exact time was, there was an exact time. How could that be relevant to us today? dealing with a pandemic. Levi Kunin. Good morning, Rabbi Michal. <clears throat> it's good to see you, Baruch Hashem. Uh, so much going on in the world. So touched by the unbelievable, unconditional love that is occurring in communities like Crown Heights, where I just heard from a friend of mine who works for the Burial Society. People are showing up to pay for burials of people that they never met before. Please take our money so we can pay for it. Please give this money to the family so they have money. It's unbelievable that despite the terrible, terrible, tragic situation happening all over the world, it's good to hear the sparks of love and goodness and kindness. And that's really ultimately what it's all about. And that's the bottom line. Before so, I answer your question. But let me, let me, just before you go any further, are yes. those who are showing up Jews? This, this is a community, a Chabad community. It's the, where the Rebbe lived. I got and it. And where the Rebbe... Are members of the community. Yeah, every, members of the community. But it's a very large community, so a lot of people don't know each other. Yeah. You know? But there's still yeah, members of that community. Correct, correct. Got it. That's correct. So, you know, we talk, first of all, the... the before I give you the, the, a little bit of a longer answer, just I want to tell you a story of, in the Talmud of a non-Jew who came into two different sages. One of the sages was known for being very, very strict in his judgment and how he delivered teachings of Torah. And the other one, whose name was Hillel, many people have heard of him. He's the author of If Not Now, When. Um, so... Hillel was always looking for ways to manifest the teachings of the Torah in a way that they were more lenient. So one day, this non-Jew walks first into the stricter guy, the Talmud tells us. He stands on one foot. He says, could you teach me the entire Torah as I stand on one foot? And Shammai had them take him, walked him out of the, out of the room. What kind of insane question is that? The entire Torah, as I stand on one foot, what are you making a joke? And then he came to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And then he came to Hillel. And he stood there on one foot. He said, could you teach me the entire Torah as I stand on one foot? And Hillel said to him, what you don't like to be done to you, don't do it to anyone else. And the rest of Torah is commentary. So, before I go into the longer conversation of Torah, I'm just saying that the relevance of Torah in that message alone, just if we could imagine if people would live that way, that before they said words to someone else, they first asked them what it would feel like if their best friend said that to them or whoever. And if we were to think about the way we feel about others in that perspective, and that the way we treat others, then we would see a world that we can't even imagine because it seems so out of reach at this point, although it's not. Having said that, <clears throat> I want to just tell you, first of all, a story of a, 
of a, a, a guy sitting on a plane. It was a, it was a Hasidic Jew, elder, an elderly, respectable person. And he had a grandson who was 11 or 12 years old that was with him. And every 15, 20 minutes, the grandfather would turn to, the grandson would turn to his grandfather and say, Zaydi, that's how we say grandpa in Yiddish, Zaydi, do you need anything? Can I help you out? And he goes to get him a tea, and he gets him this, and he gets him that. And when the plane lands, another gentleman came over to the elderly Yid and said to him, I have to tell you, I was truly struck by the deep respect that your grandson, that your grandson has demonstrated over this trip. He said, I can't even get my grandkids to talk to me. <laughs> Never mind having them sitting next to me and like that, serve and helping me like that. What's your secret? So that elderly Yid said to him, do you believe in evolution? She says, yeah, that's how I think I am. We believe in evolution. So he said, that's the distinction of our secret. He says, in your story, your ancestors were apes. And the farther we get away from that story, the more humanized we become. So why should the child look up to the grandfather? He's part of the past part of evolution. You know? <laughs> he said, in our story, yes, the Torah story begins over 4,000 years ago, but the actual giving of the Torah is 3,330 something years. And our story, the closer that people lived to the more revealed experience of Torah in a way where people really got what it was, the more powerful of an impact it had on them. And that's why we have a great reverence for the people of the chain of history, the great ones that gave their entire lives to the study of Torah in a way so people like you and I could understand it better. And that is part of Torah. So the idea of Torah is as relevant today as it was in any time and here is one reason why first of all did you want to ask me a question okay i'm sorry no sorry i thought you were at you were you were about to ask me a question no <clears throat> okay no. so I, 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 before i share a, a couple of ideas about torah i want to share with you some background there are about shem Tov, who I had spoken of in the past has a metaphor. And the metaphor is of a king who lives in his capital. In, in, that, in, in that space, there's the everything, but he's a king of the world. And therefore he also has areas, villages that are so far removed from the politics and the king and this and that, that some of these villages, the people that live there don't even know that there's such a thing called a king. Although he is their king. The king now has a son that he knows is going to be the heir to his throne. And he wants his son, it's a compassionate king, and he wants his son to be able to have a deep understanding of all levels of the society. So he sends his son to this far out village where people don't even know what a king is. They're good people, they're kind people, they're simple people. He sends, he sets it up so his son should be properly educated as his journey goes on to the degree that he can be in that environment. Instructing the people involved not to ever share with him that he's a prince and that he's the heir to the throne, etc. So the son grows up and he's 20 years old. He's wise. He's like, he's like the head of the clan. Everybody loves him. And now the king says it's time for him to come home and to start taking the next level of his education. So he sends a minister to the, to the prince. And the minister goes there and he, he gets here you know, relatively fast. And, um, and he, when he goes to see the, the, uh, the, the son, he sits down with him and says, I have to tell you something. I know it's going to sound a little crazy. This may throw you off your chair. And he starts telling him a story. And the son looks at him and says, I don't know what a king is. I don't know who you are. I have a lot of people in this village that depend on me. I'm not going anywhere. Sorry. 
not from me, but thanks for the story. It was really sweet. And then another minister and another minister. And finally, one, they all have the same response. And finally, the king says to the minister, I'm going to send you there, the younger guy. And he says, I want you just to become best friends with my son. And as do you become best friends with my son, then we'll talk about how to reveal to him. And sure enough, that's what he does. And he goes to the small village and he becomes best friends with the prince. And finally, on one intimate evening, the fellow, the, the, the minister turns to the prince and says, I have to tell you something. I hope you're not going to be upset at me for keeping this a secret for so long. By now, they're such close friends. They share everything about each other. And then he tells him what a king is and that he's a prince. And the king needs him to now connect to the fact that he's a prince. And now the prince takes it seriously. So the Baal Shem Tov says that when the infinite, beyond infinite, beyond the conversation of infinite and finite, the creator of the universe desi desired for the creation as we know it to be in existence and desired to communicate with mankind, the creator did it in a formula that's similar to the story I just shared with you. We first get in touch with the stories of the Torah as stories, history, interesting stories. By the way, all the best stories, I once heard a, a writer said, all best stories were already told in the Torah. Okay? <laughs> you got it all. You got kidnapping, you got scandals, you got the whole deal. Okay? But really in the Torah, there are four levels. And the story level of the Torah is the most primitive actual level of the Torah. And let me give you an example. The story of Abraham and Sarah, two progenitors of the Jewish people and many others of, the, of, of many others also our cousins in the Arab lands. Well, Abraham, I should say, not Sarah. Sarah is, a, is a, the mother of the Jewish people. <clears throat> but also, of course, many others. And those two have a story that we read about in the Torah. How Abraham, when he was a very young child, he discovered monotheism. And how he, he, he was tested ten times in his story of to see to the degree that the Torah is demonstrating to us how Abraham was over, over, able to overcome the, the test to prove his, his belief in what he believed to to what he shared and with the world, the idea there's only one maker, there's only one creator, everything is part of it. And there's that story that really took place. But then there's the esoteric teachings of the Torah, just as an example of this one case, where Abraham and Sarah are a code word for body and soul. And their journey going into Egypt is the journey of the soul coming into the body. And the entire conversation is one not of the past, but of the very present. It's our story. So the reason why many people feel that the Torah is not relevant because they think of it as a history book from thousands of years ago. But here's the truth of the Torah. Number one, Moses was a true prophet and proved it in front of two and a half million people at the time of the giving of the Ten Commandments. And Moses was called into the tent of the tabernacle where he would hear words he would not hear words. He would hear letters coming from the two, proving the two, I forget what you call it in English, on top of the ark in the Holy of Holies. And he would write those letters down. And that's the way the creator, which is beyond finite or infinite, communicated through letters that tell many, many different level stories. The simplest of one is the primitive of them all although there's value in all levels of the Torah. I think I'm going to take a break and let you respond or question or whatever it is. I'm talking for too long. So I heard what you said. Um, and what I want to know is how do you know that what you said is true? <clears throat> so I want to just tell you my own journey. I was, as we spoke about practicing Jew, I was brought up in a very observant Torah observant home and you know I was always always a curious kid and when I came to the age of I think 17 I was 
I came to, I had this epiphany. I said, you know, Levi Kunin is doing all this because he was brought up in this home. But if I would have been brought up in Sam Goldstein's house, then Levi Kunin would be just like Sam Goldstein. So how does it work? Everybody just gets brainwashed into their system. Do I want to live my life that way? Live my life that I'm, that, that I'm you know, just brainwashed? I started to, 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 to bombard my teachers with questions, you know? And um, I remember going to my father, having a meeting with him. I was, uh, I, made, I called him on a Thursday night and we made up to meet on Saturday night for one hour. And during that hour, first of all, I, I don't think I slept the night before because <laughs> I asked my father if he would be okay with doing one hour without any telephone calls. Without what? Without taking any telephone calls. I didn't want any distractions. I wanted to share with him what was on my heart. And, um, and I basically told him, I feel like I'm, li I'm living your life and I I'm my own life. I don't, I don't know that this is, how do I know this is what I would choose from? You know? I have so many questions, this and that. My father, God bless him. My father, he said, he said so at the end of our, my whole spiel, my teenage spiel, my father turned to me and said, so what are your plans? Now I have to tell you, I was all ready for arguments and I, had every, I went through every argument in my head of how I'm gonna respond to, if he says this, I'll say that. If he says this, I'll say that. I didn't think about plans. I didn't know what plans, who knew plans? So I looked at my father, I said, you know what, I don't know. So he gave me a big hug and he said, whatever they are, I'll stand right behind you. And that was a, a first of all, a wonderful parent experience that uh, was so powerful because, you know, being the head rabbi of Chabad of California, he would have every reason try to stop me from doing anything too stupid you know <laughs> <laughs> but um but that's but yeah, that was my story yeah. but so then what happened was that i started to discover and first of all i started to be like be very frank about my questions and in the journey i began to discover this beautiful world of jewish mysticism and how all of those questions about why and where and what and when suddenly came to light in an entirely different fashion. It's hard to really describe it in short, but I'll just say an, a metaphor that comes to mind. Recently, they developed a beautiful new technology for people who are colorblind. And you can go onto YouTube and watch people put on those glasses who never saw color in their life. And suddenly, the whole world, they put it on, they start crying. Imagine. Imagine someone not seeing color. To me, Jewish mysticism were like those glasses for me and are. And it's when we get in touch with that, and not only is the Torah relevant, and not only are our questions brought to light in a completely different way, but our life is brought to life. Because suddenly we see the unbelievable importance of every single human individual, every human being a unique importance in comparison to any other creature that exists out there. And when we could get present to that in a deeper way, then it's, uh, it, it, like I said, it just the, that's, I, I'm not saying I suddenly have all the answers. I don't. But I understand why I don't in a profound way. I understand my limitations in a profound way. So I don't know if I answered your question. One of the things in my own journey, I went, I started to read letters. I read, I read a letter from, from, from the Rebbe, where the Rebbe shows the distinction between Judaism and any other religious circle that claims to have authentic prophets to it, that only in Judaism do you have two and a half million people testifying to it. In other cases, it's a couple of people that you have to believe their story. So when I started to read letters from the Rebbe with people with questions that I had, suddenly I, I started to realize there's, a unbelievable, there's an unbelievable truth to the fact that, number one, Jews by nature are stubborn. We're referred to as stiff-necked. We ask more questions. Number two, that stiff-necked people maintained 
an unbroken chain for good reason, because there's a conversation that even the stiff neck could absorb, and even a stiff neck like me could absorb, and not just take it in a way where it transcends, it transcends, I got a burden here again. <laughs> I have a burden here again. <laughs> you know, I, I, anyway, so, so, so that's, uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's my, my answer. It's like, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And the King James Version or the, just a regular translation of the Torah, is, it's, it's not, it's, it, it's, it's not going to have that impact. But being in touch with the deeper conversation of the Torah is, is, is the way that we get answered to that question. I conclude with what King David says in Psalms. He says, Taste, and then you'll see that Havaya is good, that our Creator is good, that the Eternal is good. But first taste it, and then you'll see it. In other words, usually we see something, and then we taste it. But in this case, when it comes to the Torah, one has to taste it to understand and to see it as King David says. Not and, for sure I know I spoke too long. And, and when you, no, you didn't speak long enough. Um, but when you taste it, um, when you say you taste it, you mean you read it? I mean, I read it and they absorb in my life in a way where I get to taste it. The distinction of having a perspective of Torah versus having one where there's a lot of fear out there, you know, all the other, you know, having a, a deeper, having a conversation at a deeper level, that's tasting it, you know. But taste, but tasting it really means to learn is studying the study of Torah and the and the and the behavior of mitzvahs. Like you'll never get the feeling of how great it is to give unless you give. You know, you could learn about it. But until you give someone and touch someone's heart, you, you, can't, you can't study that. So you have to taste it and then you see it. And what happened to the gentleman who put on the tefillin for the first time? Yeah, so I shared earlier with you about the, uh, the, uh, a friend who passed away now, unfortunately, but he was. I got to know him when he was in his 60s, and he had a lot of questions about Judaism, Torah, this, that, and, and he just wasn't interested. And I would ask him to put on the tefillin, those are the phylacteries. You could Google it, T-E-F-F-I-L-I-N. And he, he always said he wasn't interested. It's something that Jewish men wrap after they're 13 years old. And it's a very big deal. And in Kabbalah, in the mystical aspect of tefillin, tefillin allow us to become available to what we refer to as the mystery, the unknown, not just the unknown, but the unknown of the unknown, allowing us to experience our soul in a powerful way, although, albeit, our limited beings don't necessarily have an immediate reaction to it in a way that we can observe yet. Having said that, I had just now studied that I had studied that teaching, and his guy's name was Mel. And uh, I saw him at a Hanukkah event, and I said, Mel, I want to ask you a question. You're a director. How, how does one receive brand new ideas? And he said, well, I guess they just come. I said, is there a tool that one could have so we can come up with more and more brand new ideas, be in touch with ideas that are beyond us now? So he's like, wow, if you had such a tool, like, well, I would, run to, I would run, to, run, to, run to the bank with it or whatever it was. So um, I said to him, if I told you I have a tool that does exactly that. So he said, really? I said, but you have to understand that since you're doing something in the mystery, it may look and feel awkward and bizarre at first. But just remember that in order to learn what you don't know, you have to be able to let go of what you know. I said, okay. I said, would you like to use my tool? And he suspiciously looked at me. And he said, okay. I said, are you a righty or a lefty? He still didn't know what I was doing. Yet. And I rolled up his 
left sleeve, and I began putting the tefillin on him, and he allowed me to. He said the blessing with me. He made the declaration of the Shema, of the one God declaration that Jewish people make twice a day. And he began to cry uncontrollably. And the first thing that came out was, but how could he allow six million of us to perish? But besides, and going on from that, there was something so soul-filled that Mel went through. I could have never convinced him that when him putting on the chillin for the first time in his life, something like that was totally a possibility because he had to taste it. So that's what I mean by taste and see. Well, Rabbi Kunin, I think we've used up most of our time. And um, there's nothing I can say that would add to what you said. Um, but I'm sure there is a doubt in people's minds, even as they listen to it. And that doubt in their minds can only be resolved by them going deeper into the question. So what I would love to do is to go deeper into that question in our next meeting, um, despite the fact that I don't have much to say about it, uh, nor intelligent questions to ask you, but I would like to proceed by moving you forward to the point where we find some resolution. And at least that resolution would be, well, what's so difficult about that? I'll try it. And that I'll try it will be that bridge between where the wandering Jew meets the practicing Jew and discovers a path forward. I intuit that, that will happen without any resistance whatsoever. I intuit that it will have come to a point in the process that there's no reason not to, and therefore a good reason to do it. At least that's the impression I'm getting. So I want to thank you for this session, and you might say goodbye to the bird. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It, it sounds like just when we're getting ready to end, the bird decided to leave. <laughs> Remember, nothing is as it seems to be. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's the DP frequency. <laughs> thank you. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.